A foundational understanding of networking and TCP IP is a must in order to even begin talking about security. Let's dive into basic networking and TCP IP. The OSI and the OSI model stands for the Open Systems Interconnect. This is a standard model that defines how open systems can communicate. The TCP IP model forms a subset of the OSI model and represents a practical implementation of what the OSI model actually prescribes. The physical layer is responsible for actually moving the bits around in the form of electronic pulses over wires or via wireless radio waves. The link layer is responsible for transferring data between a pair of endpoints on the network and to detect errors at the physical layer. Ethernet's a common link layer protocol for wired communications, much like LTE is a standard for wireless cell data transfer. The network layer of the model is responsible for routing traffic beyond local area networks over the internet. The transport layer is managed by TCP and UDP, the transmission control protocol and user data gram protocol respectively. TCP is a connection oriented protocol that ensures packet delivery. UDP is a connectionless protocol that is a best effort communication mechanism. The application layer provides protocols that exchange the actual payload data between useful programs such as browsers, email, servers, and web servers. Modern network topographies consist of core, distribution, and access layers. The core layer is a switching layer that moves data quickly in a LAN environment. Hanging off of the core switches, you typically have routers which segment IP networks within IP those networks. Uh, you have VLANs that partition off broadcast domains. And additionally, you also have wireless access points which are connected to the routers. These access points function at the access layer as well. In contrast to WANs or wide area networks, uh, which connect uh, these types of topologies over the internet. Now WANs are often depicted as clouds as the networks that are crossed include various third party networks such as various telecom providers. So with TCP IP there are many commonly used ports and protocols and here on this screen you can see a list of some of these commonly used ports and protocols and I'll walk through a few of these and I encourage that you spend some time studying some of these ports and protocols from a memorization standpoint. SNMP is the simple network management protocol and it's used by systems such as operating systems, switches and routers to report uh, monitoring data such as whether the system is up or down and system log information. FTP is the file transfer protocol and it's used for transmitting files over the internet. Port 21, you have um, secure FTP on port 22 and you notice that there are several protocols that use port 22. And so you can't have more than one service listening on the same port in a given operating system instance on uh, the same IP address. So something to keep in mind. Now SSH is used for secure shell and secure shell is used to typically remotely administer uh, switches, routers, network devices, and um, Linux and Unix operating systems. ICMP is the Internet Control Messaging Protocol and it doesn't use a port, it's actually something that functions as a transport layer protocol. So it's defined as protocol number one. Uh, another transport layer protocol of course is TCP also known as Protocol 6, UDP known as Protocol 17. You also have NetBIOS. Now NetBIOS is a Windows based um, protocol that uses UDP over port 137. So NetBIOS uh, has been used for a long time by Windows machines back to Windows 95 and probably even before that. And it's a protocol that's used to advertise Windows file uh, and print sharing services over local networks. Now over the years there have been quite a few vulnerabilities associated with NetBIOS. So you'll see that when you run network scans many times there are checks for NetBIOS and NetBIOS vulnerabilities. Telnet is another protocol that's used for uh, remote administration of systems. Now this is not encrypted and Telnet uh, is typically TCP over port 23. 
HTTP we should all be familiar with, which is port 80 by default over TCP, HTTPS or HTTP over TLS is port 443 by default, TCP. RDP is the remote desktop protocol. So this is a protocol that's used by Windows machines and there are even uh, Linux and other types of machines that can leverage this protocol, but it's primarily um, used in Windows environments. And it's port 3389 over TCP, and it's used for remote access to the desktop. SMTP is the simple message transfer protocol, and of course this is email. It's TCP port 25. It's used for sending email. POP3 and IMAP are used for receiving email. They use TCP ports 110 and 143 respectively. IMAP is more or less the successor of POP3. And then finally in this list we have DNS, which of course is the domain naming service which is used to resolve fully qualified domain names back to IP addresses. And that functions uh, typically UDP over port 53. So, any discussion of TCP IP requires that we talk about subnetting. So when we talk about subnetting, the purpose of subnetting is to divide a network into two portions, a network address. So the first portion we will divide into a network ID, and the second portion of the address, which will be on the right-hand side, we divide into a host ID. And so as we talk about subnetting, uh, it's important to understand that the way we count is actually in binary. Although the numbers are decibel, or excuse me, decimal in terms of how they're represented on paper, the calculations associated with these networks are binary. So we have three different classes of networks that are publicly addressable. They are known as class A, B, and C networks, which you can see here in the diagram. Class A networks or uh, 10.0.0 through 10.255, 255, 255. Then you have the 172 range, and then the 192 range for C-class addresses. And you can see the relative subnet masks uh, in this diagram. So just note that when you count binary, uh, binary counting starts at 0, and it goes from 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128, respectively. So when you mask the various uh, parts of the address, and basically what we're doing is we're taking the zeros and we're substituting them with ones from left to right. And as we do that, we add up via binary counting in order to get the decimal representation of the subnet mask. So, for instance, if I wanted to know what the subnet mask was for a network of 10.0.0, uh, dot zero, and let's say it was subnetted down to 255 hosts. Well, I need to come up with the number 10. And so in binary, um, you basically count the 0, 1, 2, 4, and, and you can write this down on a piece of paper. And you mask those numbers that add up to 10. So if you start with 0, well, that's obviously nothing. Um, and then 1, and then the 2, so that's 3, and then the 4 is the next number, so that's 7. Now the challenge here is, is that that doesn't really work because the next number is 8, so you'd have 15. So you have to pick a combination of those numbers that will add up to 10. In this case, we can mask the 0. Um, we would not mask the 1. We would mask with a binary 1, the 2. We would not mask the 4, and we would mask the 8. And so 8 plus 2 obviously is 10. So this is how binary counting works and I suggest and recommend that you spend some time studying binary counting and more detailed information about how you split out network addresses and network IDs from host IDs. But it's important to understand these concepts. Now to make things even more complex, um, the numbering scheme for TCP IP which has been version 4, um, is now translating into IP version 6, which is counted in hexadecimal. But uh, many of the exams that uh, you will encounter at this point in terms of certification and testing will still typically cover uh, binary IP addressing and network IDs. 
So NAT is network address translation. And so network address translation is a protocol that is used to essentially hide private networks uh, or even networks that are using publicly routable addresses uh, behind an IP. And so initially this was used to do things such as conserve and preserve um, TCP IP version 4 address spaces. And so it's really a methodology of remapping one IP address space into another by modifying the network address information in the IP datagram packet headers while they're in transit across a traffic routing device. The immediate benefit of NAT is that it allows a single internet connection with a single IP address to be shared. The technique, as I mentioned, was really for rerouting traffic in IP networks without having to renumber every host. Now, it's become very popular and an essential tool in conserving global address space for IP version 4 networks. And of course, that shortage of addresses is not so much of an issue with the advent or advent of IP version 6. As consumers at home, we all use private IP addresses behind NAT-enabled routers that are connected to our modems. Sometimes the modems, the, which are uh, coupled with firewall and NAT functionalities, uh, have this capability all in one device, which we typically call the router. Now with NAT, all commu communications that are sent to external hosts actually contain the external IP address and port information of the NAT device instead of the internal host IP addresses or po port numbers. Now when a computer on the private network sends an IP version 4 packet to the external network, the NAT device replaces the internal IP address in the source field of the packet um, with the sender's address, which is the sender's address, with the external IP address of the NAT device. Now, port address translation, or PAT, may then assign the connection a port number from a pool of available ports, inserting this port number in the source field, much like the post office box number. And it forwards the packet to the external network. The NAT device then makes an entry in a translation table containing the internal IP address, the original source port, and the translated source port. So this is key. Subsequent packets from the same connection and that are responding back to the same connection are translated to the same port number. The computer receiving a packet that's undergone NAT establishes a connection to the port and IP address that's specified in the altered packet. It's oblivious to the fact that the supplied address is being translated. So going further with the post office analogy, it could be analogous to using a post office box number instead of your home address. A packet coming from the external network is mapped to a corresponding internal IP address and port number from the translation table. It in turn replaces the external IP address and port number in the incoming packet header, which once again, is similar to the translation from a post office box number to your street address. The packet's then forwarded over the inside network. Otherwise, if the destination port number of the incoming packet isn't found in the translation table, the packet's dropped or rejected because the port address translation functionality of the NAT device doesn't know where to send it. NAT only translates IP addresses and ports of its internal hosts, hiding the true endpoint of an internal host on a private network. So in summary, having a basic understanding of core networking concepts is a prerequisite to the study of cybersecurity. In this lesson, we learned about the OSI model, TCP IP, some common ports and protocols, how to subnet IP addresses, and we also learned about NAT. In subsequent lessons, we'll shift our focus on how to attack TCP IP by exploiting core vulnerabilities in the protocol. Click on the webofsecurity.com link for the latest in cybersecurity news, test prep materials, including sample test questions, flashcards, ebooks, hands on labs, study notes, and special offers for newly released cybersecurity training content.